Welcome to another installment of Building Performance Around the World with the Building Performance Journal. This time we're featuring one of our favorite scientists we've ever met. Charlie Weschler, and he is an indoor chemist who is absolutely wonderful at bringing the storytelling to life. I adore Charlie. We met him actually originally at the Home Chem Experiment in Austin, and if you haven't seen that playlist after this video, go check it out. We're featuring Charlie here because he's been working for decades on three continents, studying the chemistry of the indoors. Here he is. Hey, Charlie. I've been studying the chemicals in indoor air, where they come from, how they react with one another, and how they get into us uh, for a very long time. It's important to appreciate that we have many, many, many chemicals in our indoor air. Fortunately, they're present at relatively low concentrations, and at these low concentrations, the majority of them are innocuous. But some of them can contribute to bad odors, and in some cases, they can contribute to ill health. The chemicals that are in indoor air, a number of these can react with one another. We're not as aware of the products of the indoor chemistry as we are of the original chemicals. The chemicals that come from outdoors, we have a sense of what they are. The chemicals that are present indoors because of the products we use or our furnishings or our materials. Again, we have a sense of what they are because ingredients are listed on product labels or you can go to different websites and read what chemicals might be emitted by a new couch. You might be familiar with the flame retardants that are used in a couch or a personal computer. You might know something about the plasticizers that are used in your floor. But the mystery compounds are the compounds that result when pollutant A reacts with pollutant B to give something that isn't on your list of ingredients that you can't read about when you go to the web to see what the flame retardant is. These chemicals that are, that are a consequence of indoor chemistry, some of them can be quite reactive. Reactive chemicals are not a good thing in environments where you have human beings. Reactive chemicals can react with us with consequences that can be deleterious to our health. I've had the privilege to live and teach and conduct research, not just in the United States, but also in Denmark and China. And this has given me an opportunity to observe differences in the chemical sources in those three different countries and the indoor chemistry that might occur in those three different countries. Let's start with ventilation in the United States versus Europe. In the United States, if a home has whole house air conditioning, that air, when the system is running, is recirculated. There's no deliberate intent to bring in ventilation air. In Denmark, recirculation does not occur. It's not permitted. The houses in Denmark, historically, they were tighter than houses in the United States. So it's more important in, in Northern Europe, certainly, to intentionally design for fresh air, to dilute chemicals that have indoor sources. In the United States, historically, we've re relied to a certain extent on the leakiness of the structure when the windows are closed to bring in the outdoor air to dilute the chemicals that have indoor sources. When I started going to Denmark about 20 years ago, the scented products that you could buy in a grocery store were there were many fewer of them than there were in the United States. I've seen that change. Today, you can buy almost as many scented products in Denmark as you can here. Now, if we jump to China, there the use of scented products is still quite low. Mm -hmm. Cleaning in China tends to be very simple. 
very elementary. They avoid cleaning products in most homes. They tend to use water in a mop. Maybe if they add something to the water, it might be vinegar. It might be a little bit of ammonia. It might be some simple soap. But in most situations, it's just water in a mop or water in a cloth and frequently changing that water. Quite different from how we clean in the United States or how people clean in Denmark. And I've mentioned cooking. And in China, cooking can be a large source of particles while the cooking is actually occurring. The wok is a wonderful vessel. You've got those hot sides as well as the hot bottom, right? And it really, I mean, it was designed for the kind of cooking it does. Um, but when you're frying food in a wok, you generate lots of particles. And if you're not using an exhaust hood, you're going to turn on a smoke alarm. In the apartment that we've lived in in China, we had a range hood that really had a large fan. Um, felt like an airplane was taking off when you turned on the, the, the range hood. There was a design flaw, however. We were on the second floor and it was a three-story apartment. And there was one run from the apartment below us to us to the apartment above us for the duct work for that range hood. So when the apartment below us cooked, the exhaust from their range hood would start dumping into our apartment. We had to turn our range hood on whenever they ran their range hood to send it up. And hopefully whoever was on the third floor also turned their hood on to get the exhaust out of the apartment. I think it's important to appreciate that the chemicals in our homes today are substantially different than the chemicals that were in our homes 40 years ago, 70 years ago. The chemicals that your parents grew up with were different from the chemicals that you've grown up with. And the chemicals that your grandparents grew up with were even more different from the chemicals that you grew up with. The big change in the chemicals that are present in our home came after World War II. If you look at the chemicals that were in products in 1950 and can compare them to the chemicals that are in products today, huge difference. Think of some of the products that were used in a home in 1950 versus today. Carpets. Synthetic carpets were relatively uncommon in 1950. Today, it's cotton or wool that's relatively uncommon. If you use a synthetic carpet, you probably have a flame retardant, at least in the carpet backing. You probably have an anti-stain agent, some kind of perfluorinated chemical that's been applied to the surface of the carpet. So if you spill that wine on a white carpet, it's not a disaster. You can wipe it off. Okay. A very different set of chemicals. The, the flooring, vinyl, PVC. When did PVC start to take off in homes? After World War II. It's not just flooring. You know, we have PVC in, uh, in synthetic leather. We have beach balls. We have raincoats. We have shower curtains. Uh, PVC is everywhere. We have all these appliances today that we didn't have in 1950. And the appliances bring with them their own set of chemicals. Think of a dishwasher. A dishwasher uses a special type of detergent, right? You can't take hand soap and grind it up and use it in your dishwasher. Disastrous result. Um, clothes washer, similar situation. You have a special detergent for your clothes washer. There are some unintended consequences of those detergents that are used in our dishwasher or clothes washer. 
those detergents contain a chemical that when it it actually does its thing in the dishwasher or clothes washer breaks down and gives you nonophenols among other products nonophenol it's a big name don't worry about the fact that it's a big name mm -hmm. i just want to make the point that nonophenol is one of these compounds that is a potent endocrine disruptor it can behave like a hormone so we wind up being exposed to some nonophenol when we use certain detergents in our dishwasher or in our clothes washer your parents in 1950 or your grandparents had a much lower exposure to nonophenol because they didn't have a dishwasher they didn't have a clothes washer There's good news, you know, smoking indoors is so much less common than it used to be. And smoking indoors is a terrible source of chemicals, a lot of bad chemicals from smoking. Uh, so that's good news. And we've gotten rid of heavy metals that we know are toxic. We don't have lead in our paint anymore. We don't have mercury in our paint anymore. If you get rid of smoking, you get rid of cadmium. That's good news. Some of the pesticides that used to be used indoors, we don't use them any known anymore. We know that they're bad for us as well as what, what we were trying to kill with them. Um, so there's plenty of good news, but we have all these additional chemicals, synthetic chemicals that weren't there 50 years ago. How we begin to address these problems when the anticipated variation from home to home in a country or from country to country is quite large. There are some commonalities and I'll begin with us, okay? In an occupied environment, by definition, humans are present. I mentioned ozone earlier. It turns out that ozone reacts with certain chemicals in our skin oil. Whenever you have a human being present and ozone present, that chemistry always happens. It's going to happen in the United States. It's going to happen in Europe. It's going to happen in China. That ozone human chemistry is a commonality. The world truly is becoming more homogeneous or well mixed. Many of the products that are used in the United States are also used in Europe, are also used in China. Having said that, there certainly are differences and some of those differences are quite large. Cooking emissions, very different style of cooking, different ingredients to begin with. So yes, we have these variations, but we also have these commonalities. It's important to be mindful of the variations where they're significant. And we need to study these variations more. But we, we shouldn't just throw up our hands and say, oh, everything's different. It's an impossible study, impossible problem to study. We begin with the commonalities and then we can start to look at the differences among homes, among countries. We're going to link below to a paper that Charlie published about this history of chemicals inside homes. So check that out if you want to get way deeper into the details. And also, if you want to arm yourself with more knowledge about your own indoor chemistry, check out sixclasses.org for a lot of video content and great information about really harmful chemicals that are happening in your home. Special thanks to the Building Performance Association and the Building Performance Journal. Go read that if you haven't already. Make sure that you comment as well if you have anything to say about indoor chemistry, especially in other countries. Like and subscribe. Tune in next time.